Subhanallah Walhamdulillah La ilaha illallah Wallahu akbar Subhanallah Walhamdulillah La ilaha illallah Wallahu akbar Alhamdulillah ya da'afa ma hamidahu jami'u khalqihi kama yuhibbuhu wa yaradah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad al-Nabiyyil Ummi wa ala alihi wa sallim Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Rabbana yassir wa la tu'assir wa tammin bil khair wa bika nasta'in ya fatah سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. First of all, we give our praise and our thanks to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for all the favors and bounties Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has bestowed on us. And we send salat and salam and his last and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. As we all know, we are heading into the month of Ramadan, tonight being the 29th night of Sha'ban. It is just natural for us as believers that we are going to be excited. We are going to wait anxiously to welcome the holy and the blessed month of Ramadan. And as it gets closer and closer, our excitement increases. And sometimes you have a lot of people that do a lot of preparations. There's a lot of cleaning, a lot of preparing different things to ensure that when the month of Ramadan starts, there's not too much cleaning to do. There's not too much of this, not too much of that. So that they could focus a lot of their time in the actual things that will benefit them in the month of Ramadan. And as believers, many of us, we look forward the certain things in the month of Ramadan. We look forward firstly to the fasting. So when we hear Ramadan, the first thing that we think about is fasting. It is the time that I'll have to fast. So we look forward for fasting during the days of the month of Ramadan. We look forward to building a connection with Allah, with reciting a lot of Quran in the month of Ramadan. We look forward to the iftars. Many of us, we are accustomed of always going every night to the mosque to have an iftar. And that is something that we have grown accustomed to and to congregate and that togetherness that we feel in the month of Ramadan. So <clears throat> that is something that we look forward to as well, the having the iftars and going out to iftars. We look forward to Tarawih in the nights of the month of Ramadan, spending long hours in the night, one hour something, two hours, standing up, listening to sometimes the entire Quran in the month of Ramadan, being spaced out throughout the month of Ramadan. So these are the things that we as Muslims and as believers, we look forward to every year the month of Ramadan comes. Many masjids will put things in place to prepare for the month of Ramadan. But we all know things are going to be different this year. It is not going to be as normal as it used to be. And instead of having this lavish iftar that we are accustomed to, it is going to be a year that we're going to have very simple iftars with our family at home. Instead of standing up in the night for tarawih with a, a, the entire community there, <clears throat> it is going to be a time that we are going to have to have a small congregation at home and perform our salat. But with putting that aside, what we have remaining still 
from this month of Ramadan. There are some things that are, we are going to lose, which, for example, as I mentioned, the big lavish iftars, the tarawih. But there are some things that we are still going to have in the month of Ramadan. One is we are still going to have our fasting. That is not going to change. So even if we are shut down, even if we are in quarantine, we are still going to have to fast from morning to evening, morning until sunset. So the fasting is still there. The attachment to the Quran, the shutdown and the quarantine will not affect our relationship and our attachment to the Quran. Many of us might not, as I mentioned, might not be able to stand up and listen to the entire Quran being recited in Tarawih, which we are accustomed to, but we can still read the Quran from cover to cover. We can still recite a lot of the Quran to be connected to the Quran. And every single action that we had in the month of Ramadan, we could still do it in this month of Ramadan. But we're going to do it in a smaller scale instead of the, the hugeness that we had before. So still have iftar, but with our families. Still have tarawih, but with our families at home, very small congregation still be able to give our sadaqah till fitr, still be able to pay our zakat, every single thing we're still going to get. As well as the month itself, the blessings which the month of Ramadan brings to us, that is still going to remain. That is not going to go. So be it if the government puts a curfew or put a shutdown, the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent in the month of Ramadan, it is still going to remain. Be it if we are indoors or we are outdoors, that blessings are still going to be there. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Ida the Khala Ramadan, Futihat Abwabil Jannah. He says, when Ramadan enters, that is the first night of Ramadan, when you see the moon, he says, Futihat Abwabil Jannah, the doors of Jannah, the doors of paradise are open. And the reason for the doors of paradise to be open is not so that anyone will enter paradise in the month of Ramadan. You know, long ago, we, we have this belief anybody die in the month of Ramadan, they're going straight to paradise because the doors of paradise are open. No, the reason for the doors of paradise to be open in the month of Ramadan from the first day we see the moon is so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Zalu Rahma, Allah could send down his Rahma and his mercy on us. Allah could send down his mercy on the believers. Allah could send down his mercy to the world by opening the doors of paradise. And at the same time, Gulikat Abu Abu Naru. At the same time, the doors of the fire of Jahannam, they are closed. And the reason for them being closed is so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restricts the type of the kind of temptations and the type of evil that would be outside of the month of Ramadan. And the Prophet said, Wasusilat is shayateen. Your shaitan is going to be chained. Now we are at home. We can still be involved in sins at home. But in a month of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to protect us. Allah is going to protect us by chaining the shayateen. So even though many of us say that we are chained up right now, we're at home, shaitan is also going to be chained up from the first night of the month of Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu says, awwalahu rahma, the first 10 days of the month of Ramadan, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He sends down His rahma, He sends down His mercy on us. So that first 10 days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sends his mercy. Because the first 10 days is the most difficult days of the month of Ramadan. Because for many of us, after Ramadan and the six days that we might have fasted in Shawwal and the Ashura, we might have fasted in Arafah, one, one day, that is all we really fast for the year. So when Ramadan starts, you're getting accustomed back to it. It is something new. That is why the first few days, the first two to three days is very difficult. You find it hard. And then as the days pass, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth day, as, as it goes by, you realize that it is getting easier and easier. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sends, the first send is he sends his rahma, his mercy to make it easy for us because he knows that it is going to be the first 10 days is going to be the most difficult and the hardest. And he says, He says the middle 10 days, the second 10 days of the month of Ramadan is filled with maqfara and forgiveness. And this is what we want. We want Allah to forgive us for all the sins. 11 months we are committing sins. And Allah is given us maghfir, Allah is given us forgiveness now in the second 10 days of Ramadan. But with what we should realize as well, not because the second 10 days is considered to be the 10 days of maghfir or that Allah is not going to have rahma on us. Allah's rahma is for the entire month of Ramadan. Allah's maghfir, Allah's forgiveness is for the entire month of Ramadan. If we seek Allah's forgiveness on the first day of Ramadan, Allah could forgive us. Allah doesn't have to wait on the second 10 days to grant us maqfur and forgiveness. But when he says the first 10 days is rahmah, which means Allah gives a lot more mercy on the first 10 days of Ramadan. And the second 10 days of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives a lot more maqfur and a lot more forgiveness. And the last 10 days of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us emancipation, freedom from the fire of Jahannam. So this is what still remains with us. The rahmah, the maghfirah, the forgiveness, freedom from the fire of Jahannam, that is still going to be remaining. The blessings of the month of Ramadan is still going to remain with us. The doors of paradise is still going to be open. The doors of the fire of Jahannam is still going to be closed. In one narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the last day in the month of Shaban, which is the last day before beginning the month of Ramadan, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he noticed the excitement of the companions because it was natural for them as well that from six months before Ramadan comes, they would start to prepare for the month of Ramadan. And this is the last day before the beginning of the month of Ramadan. So he saw how excited the companions were. So he used that opportunity now. This is the day just before Ramadan starts. And he uses it to give them a sermon to deliver an address to them. And there's a very lengthy address and my topic is not based upon the address so we're just going to deal with the beginning we're just going to look at how the prophet sallallahu introduced ramadan to his companions knowing that they're all excited knowing that they're all waiting anxiously waiting tomorrow is fasting tomorrow tonight i might have tarawi knowing the excitement that is building up in the companions Look at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he addressed them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, Qad adhullukum shahrun azim, shahrun mubarak. He says, certainly, shahrun azim, certainly a great month is dawning upon you. Shahrun mubarak, a blessed month is going to dawn upon you. That is, in the morning, you're going to be in a blessed month. In the morning, by this evening, when you see the moon, the month of Shaban is going to be finished, and you're going to head into the month of Ramadan. And it's not an ordinary month. He says, Shahrun Azim, a great, mighty month. A blessed month, Shahrun Mubarak. But look at what how he introduced it. He did not say, Yaji'ukum, that it is coming to you, or Yatikum also means to come to you. He did not use those words. He didn't say, alaykum, it is coming to you. All of these words are used to portray something which is approaching, something which is coming. The Prophet did not use those words. The Prophet used the word Adhallukum. Adhallukum, translated as dawn upon you, but it comes from the word dhillun. 
Dillon in Arabic, which means a shield. So the, the, to portray the word to come to you, dawning upon you, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uses the word Dillon, Adhallukum, which means a shield. He says that month that you're excited, that is coming to you, it is just like that of a shield. Imagine you're in the desert. And the desert, there are no trees, only sun. And sun is beating you in the middle of the day. And you see a patch of clouds heading in your direction. You're excited. Just as how we're excited for Ramadan, this person seeing that patch of cloud coming in their direct direction, they're going to be very, very excited. And then as the cloud comes to them, and they're under the shade, they are so happy. When we start in the month of Ramadan, we're going to be very happy. You're going to be very happy of the month of Ramadan. But that shade over that person's head is not going to remain forever. It's not a permanent shade. It is a very temporary shade. You're going to get a little five minutes relaxation on it. And then by the time he knows it, the sun or the, the wind is pushing away the clouds away from the sun and the sun starts to beat him. He starts to get the scorching sun back again. Similarly, the month of Ramadan is like that. We're excited. It comes to us. We are happy. And by the time you know it is the day of Eid. And when the day of Eid comes, we get back the heat of the shayateen we get back the heat of the fire of Jahannam because the doors of Jahannam now are open, the shayateen, they are released. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is letting them know you're excited, yes, but know that it is very, very short excitement. The month of Ramadan is not coming to stay. The month of Ramadan is coming as a guest and it is moving very fast. And if you don't take advantage of it, it is going to go away without you attaining anything. And the Prophet Sallallahu did course the people who witnessed the month of Ramadan and they did not achieve the forgiveness from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Imagine witnessing 29 to 30 days of the month of Ramadan and still didn't get Allah's maqfara, Allah's forgiveness. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Wa ilulahu, woe to him. Woe to that individual. He said, Amin to the dua of Jibreel alayhi salam. So this is the month of Ramadan that we are all approaching. We are happy, we are excited, and we want to ensure that we do as much good deeds as we could do in this month of Ramadan that is coming so that we can get Allah's maqtara. We can achieve as much good deeds as possible. If you look at the five pillars, of Islam and we look into the Quran we're going to see for the five pillars four of the pillars they are spread out all over the Quran different places you're going to see them across the Quran but when it comes to fasting the pillar of fasting that is only one part of the Quran. In one surah only, one section of the Quran, you're going to find Ramadan and fasting. So for example, if you look into the Quran and you read the Quran, you're going to see the word Iman. Ya ladina amanu, inna ladina amanu. You're going to see about Iman and belief. You're going to see that four to five times mentioned in the Quran and not in one surah, but different, different surahs. Throughout the Quran, you're going to read, O you who believe, certainly those who believe and do righteous deeds. Iman, you're going to find that four to five times throughout the Quran, different, different surahs. As for salat, you're going to see salat 67 times mentioned in the Quran in different, different surahs, spaced out. Allah did not just take one passage and just spoke about salat. Allah kept on reminding us different different surahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us about our salat 67 times. As for zakat, it is mentioned 32 times in the Quran, times with salat, and other times by itself. 
but 32 times in different, different surahs of the Quran. And as for Hajj is mentioned 31 times in the Quran, different parts of the Quran, you're going to see the pillar of Hajj. But when it comes to fasting, and it comes to the month of Ramadan, fasting in the month of Ramadan, only one surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about fasting. Only one surah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not space it out in even that one surah. Allah did not space it out in that surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed all together at one place. That is from verse 183 to 187 of Surah Al-Baqarah. We know Surah Al-Baqarah is the biggest surah or the largest surah in the Quran. Uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 183 to verse 187 speaks about Ramadan and fasting. Besides these ayats, no other ayat in the Quran speaks about Ramadan and the fasting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just take one passage and give us this pillar of Ramadan and fasting. Whereas the, all the other pillars we have seen, different, different parts of the Quran. And 183 starts with the ayah that we are accustomed, that we hear a lot. The ayah that I had begun with as well. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala alladina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. That same ayat, O you who believe, fasting is prescribed on you as it was prescribed on those before you, perhaps you may gain taqwa, God consciousness. We're going to just translate it as God consciousness for the period of time. So this is the ayat that it begins with, which is ayat number 183 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And from there on until 187, only about fasting, Allah summarize everything that he needs to tell us about fasting in these few passages. He did not say anything about it in Surah Ali Imran. He did not say anything about it in Surah Al-Nisa. He did not say anything about it in Surah Al-Kaf. No other Surah, only Surah Al-Baqarah 183 to 187. Now to appreciate, to appreciate this passage and especially the beginning ayat that Allah begins with to start to speak about fasting. When Allah says, Ya Yuladina Amanu Kutiba Alaikum Asiyam, first to understand and appreciate that ayat, let us look at the sequence of the ayats before it. Before Allah tells us that fasting is going to perhaps bring about taqwa. Let us look at the ayats that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke a little bit before. From ayat 177, that ayat is known as Ayatul Birr. Ayatul Birr, which says, Laysa al Birr an tawallu wujuhakum kibla al mashriki wal maghrib wala kinna al Birr man aman. To the end, it tells you that righteousness is not to turn your faces to the east and the west, but righteousness is to believe in Allah and do this and do that. This is what Allah tells us in verse 177. So 177, Allah is telling us to have individual taqwa, individual God consciousness. If we practice the qualities mentioned in ayat 177, Allah ends that ayat by saying, Ula'ika humul muttaqoon. See, same word, same word taqwa as in fasting. Allah says those people, they are from amongst the muttaqoon. They are from amongst those who are God conscious. So if you inculcate the qualities of birr and the qualities of righteousness as an individual, then you could achieve taqwa. So one is ayat number 177, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of individual God consciousness, individual taqwa. And then from 177, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in 178 and 179, Allah moves on from, collect, from individual taqwa to collective taqwa. 178 and 179, in Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about kisos. Kisos, which is retaliation. 
an eye for an eye, an ear for an ear. Allah is telling you that you need to be God conscious with regards to your rights to human beings. The way how you treat human beings, you need to be God conscious as well. And we as a society collectively need to fulfill justice and have that God consciousness collectively. So when you had 177, individual righteousness, individual taqwa, individual God consciousness, and then 178 and 179, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us we need to have a collective God consciousness by fulfilling the rights of kisos and retaliation, giving justice to everyone. And then 180, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then moves on now. So we have individual, then we have collective taqwa, and then Allah goes on to semi-collective taqwa. In 180, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about inheritance. Now, that is about your family. When someone dies, especially the breadwinner of a home, when he dies, maybe the father of the home passes away. That is when all, as we say it in local terms, that is when all the bacchanals dies. That is when all the confusion and all the quarrel and all the dispute, that is when one family wants to take another to court. That is when everything starts. Allah now tells you from being collected, Allah is giving you a semi-collective, which is amongst your family, to have taqwa called consciousness with your dealings with your family. And he uses the time that we have the most amount of disputes. Allah uses that time. And then Allah says, Haqqan ala al-muttaqi. The ending of, surah, uh, of verse 118, Allah says, these people who fulfill the rights of inheritance when their parents die. He says, Haqqan ala al-muttaqi. They are the truthful ones are those who are the muttaqin, who have done, fulfilled their rights, they are the muttaqin. They are the God conscious one. So again, we had from 177, individual taqwa. 178 and 179, collective taqwa with regards to retaliation. Then 180, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about our family, which is semi-collective taqwa. And then 183, which is the Idra one, Allah now goes back now to individual taqwa, which is fasting. So Allah carries us now back to having that individual taqwa now. After starting it from since 177, Allah now brings us back. We need to, don't forget about ourselves. Because one, 177 was telling us about ourselves, and then it took us to everyone. And then it took us towards our family. When Allah says, hey, don't forget what we mentioned in 177. In order to build what you did in 177, you have to fast. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about fasting. Now, when we look at this ayat, we're going to start the ayat. As I mentioned in the, the, the topic, the name of the topic was exploring Ramadan from the Quran. So even though there are many, many hadiths speaking about Ramadan and fasting, and many times you might have heard these things from different scholars, I would like to go through the different ayats of the Quran. So we're exploring what Allah tells us about fasting Ramadan by the ayats 183 to 187 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he himself has mentioned to us. So we're going to expound a little bit on 183 to 187 to understand Ramadan and fasting from the Quran, what the Quran says about it. So Allah begins, O you believe, fasting is prescribed upon you. Now the word saw, the word saw as it was, Allah used the word siyam, which is saw, fasting. The Arabs, before Islam used, were accustomed using the word saum, not for fasting, but for something different. When they trained a horse 
the fights in their battles and in war, they would consider that as sound. They trained the horse as sound. So when they train their horse, we know a camel, Allah has created a camel suitable enough for the desert that it is able to, to stay a long period without water. The eyes, Allah has created the eyes in such a way that it could withstand the dust and the sand that is coming its way. So Allah has created the camel, especially for the desert, but the camel is not suitable enough and not tactical enough with regards to fighting. Whilst the horse is suitable for fighting and war, but it is not suitable. Allah did not create that really for the desert. It is not suitable enough for the desert. It can't stay a long period without water like the camel. So what the, the Arabs used to do is they used to spend a lot of time in training these horses so that it is going to now be suitable. So even though at the beginning it is not suitable to go and fight, the, because of the amount of training that they were put into these horses. After a time, those same horses now were suitable enough to go and fight in the desert. So when they heard, for the first time, they heard the word fasting, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned the word fasting, the first thing clicked to them is those horses that we were training for battle. That was the first idea came into them that this man is telling us that just as how we train our horses, we have to train ourselves. So all the energy that we took in training the horses, he's saying, instead of training those horses, you need to train yourself. And this is what fasting does. Fasting is something that trains us in order to help us go through our life. It is mentioned that the Literal meaning of fasting is imsak. <clears throat> Literal meaning of fasting is imsak. And imsak, which means to stay away from something. That is fasting, literally. So when you're staying away from something, that is known as fasting, literally. But we know from the sharia, the sharia meaning of fasting is to stay away from eating, drinking, sexual relationships with one spouse from morning until, from the break of dawn, subasodic, until sunset with an intention. Must have an intention. If there's no intention, there's no fasting. Must have an intention. So this is what the Sharia has given us as fasting. No eating, no drinking, no relationship from morning until evening. So from subasodic until sunset, with a specific intention that you're fasting for Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Asamu Jannah. He says, this action of fasting, it is a Jannah, it is a shield. It protects you because it is straining your body, it is straining you as an individual. So it is something that is going to protect you. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was encouraging the companions to get married, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, those of you who can't do that, he says, Fa alaykum bisawm. If you're in a position that you cannot get married, then Fa alaykum bisawm, then just keep fast. Because fasting is going to protect you. Fasting is going to help you. Fasting is the shield. Fasting is something that protects an individual. So then Allah, after saying, Ya yuhla deena amun, kutiba alaykum usiyam, Allah says, Kama ala min just as how he has ordained fasting to those before you. Which tells us that fasting is not only compulsory for us, but all the other nations in the past also had to fast. The Christians had their share of fasting. The Jews have their share of fasting. And every religion that you think about, they have some sort of fasting, even though the fasting is different from us because if you look literally as you mentioned literal meaning of fasting is to restrain yourself from something so for example if someone say i'm not eating meat my fasting is staying away from meat that is fasting for them because they are staying away from something in islam our fasting details that we stay away from food drink and so and so but if their fasting tells them to stay away from it that is also a type of fasting 
So all the religions in the past also had fasted. Some of them, their fasting was easier than ours. And there were others which their fasting were more difficult than ours. For example, when Maryam, alayhi salam, when after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted her Jesus alayhi salam, she gave birth to Jesus alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, she was scared to go back and face the people and her community because she was thinking they were to stone me to death. They might say I am an evil woman and all those things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed her through Jibreel alayhi salam that you should say, Inni nadartu li rahmani sawman falan ukallim al yawma insiya. You should say to the people, when they start to make claims and start to batalk you and start to degrade you, just don't reply to them. All that you should say is, I have made a vow that I'm fasting. Now, when we hear fasting, we know like it's just speak when you're fasting. But the fasting for them in those days was no food, no drink, no sexual relation, as well as no speaking. They were not allowed to speak as well. So their fasting was more difficult than our fasting. So when she said that in Nadarut Rahmani Salman, I have made a vow that I am fasting for Allah, which means she can't say nothing else after that. That was it. That was final. And they keep on asking, but they know that they can't get any reply. But what she did, as we know, that she pointed to Jesus Alayhi Salam, but we will not get into that. But it shows us that they also had fasting and their fasting were difficult. So some people in the past, some nations, their fasting was easier and others, their fasting were difficult. The Jews, their fasting is easier than ours. We're going to see that in the other few ayats. So Allah says, Kama kutiba ala min kablikum. Allah says, La allakum tatakun. Allah says, the reason I've given you fasting, the reason I've given the people in the past fasting is la allakum tatakun. Perhaps you may be God conscious. You may be God fearing. Now the word taqwa, as you mentioned from since 177, Allah was speaking about taqwa. If you have beer, you are mutakin. You deal in kisos, you are mutakin. You deal with the, you fulfill the right of inheritance, you are mutakin. Similarly, now you fast, la allakum takun. Perhaps you get taqwa. The word taqwa is mentioned 190 places in the Quran is a lot different places you go you're going to see the word taqwa in different forms but the word taqwa is mentioned 190 places in the quran most times you look into the quran we see it is translated as god consciousness it is translated as god fairness but it is a lot more deeper than that one of the the meaning of taqwa is wiqaya Wiqaya, which means a shield, <clears throat> a shield. A shield is something that protects you, a barrier, a protective barrier. And it is said that taqwa is that protective barrier that is between a servant. A servant uses this protective barrier to protect himself from the things that bring about the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is taqwa. So, Taqwa is when you're conscious enough to know that, you know what, these things are displeasing to Allah and I'm not going to do that. So you put a barrier, you put a shield to stop you from going and involve yourself in those actions that are going to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala angry. Uh, it is mentioned also that once Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he met up with Ubay bin Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he asked Ubay bin Kaab, what is taqwa? Tell me what is taqwa. Ubay bin Kaab, he was Qari al-Ummah. One of the Qari's of the Ummah. When we say Qari in those days, not just recitation of the Quran, best reciter, best kufas, and learned about the Quran. So Ubay bin Kaab, instead of replying to him just like that, he said to him, have you ever 
Travor Sapat, where you see you have to, had the pass through a patchy area with a lot of thorns. Have you ever had to pass through such an area? Omar who says, yes, I did pass through areas like that before. Ubay bin Kaab then asks Omar how did you pass through the thorny patches that were there? Omar Anhu he said, I fold up my clothing and I took my time to go through, pushing aside this branch, pushing aside that branch, because I knew if I just go straight through, it is going to prick me all over. And I didn't want to get pricked all over. So I took my time, push aside this branch, put aside that branch and try my best to walk through. Obay bin Kaab, brother Anhu, he said, that is taqwa. Says that is taqwa. Taqwa is when you take your time, cautious, recognizing that Allah is watching you, being conscious that Allah is seeing you. You don't want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get angry with you, so you're taking your time and ensuring that you're going to go through in a smooth manner that is not going to bring about the displeasure from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is taqwa. So Allah says, La He says, if you fast, if you fast, then you could achieve this taqwa. Because fasting is something that helps us. He says, maybe, la'allakum tatakun. Because it is dependent on each individual. Some individual, they fast the whole day and all they get is hunger and torch. This is from the Prophet as well. But if you do it in the right way, then the fasting itself should assist you and help you in order to reach this state of taqwa and God consciousness. Because imagine you're staying away from food, food which is halal. You're staying away from water, water which is halal. And the only reason you're staying away from these things is because Allah tells you to do that. So you want to make Allah please. And you know that if you do not do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be displeased with you. So you don't want to make Allah displeased, so you fast. You stay away from food, even though food is halal, you stay away from drink. Much less things which are haram. We have known most Muslims who have committed sins throughout the year. 11 months they are committing sin. But when Ramadan reaches, they stop completely. Cut off all sins immediately. Stay away from that sin for the whole month of Ramadan. Unfortunately, after Ramadan, many of them go back and continue their sins. But it shows that if you do it in the right way, and you fast with the right intention, and you do it the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do after that 30 days, you're not supposed to go back to anything because you have been trained enough to stay away from things which brings about the displeasure of Allah. The next ayat, now this was, this, that was ayat 183. The next ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ayyama ma'adurat, which is ayat 184. Allah says, a few days. Fasting is not long. Fasting is only a few days. He that did not make fasting the whole year. Allah says, Ayyama ma'adurat, a few days. It is mentioned that if you look at the ayat, Nothing is spoken about yet about Ramadan. Ya ayu ladina amanu kutiba alaykum musiyam kama kutiba ala ladina kablikum na allakum tatakun. Nothing about Ramadan. So when this ayat was revealed, it was speaking about the fasting of Ashura. The fasting of Ashura was compulsory. That is when the Prophet Sallallahu went to Medina, started the fast of Ashura. We all know about that, so I'm not going to go into details about the fasting of Ashura. So that fasting now, when this ayat was revealed, in this instance, no Ramadan as yet, they had the month of Ramadan, but fasting in the month of Ramadan was not compulsory as yet. The only fasting is the fasting of Ashura. Also, it is mentioned that there were the three days in every month that was also compulsory for them. This is how the Jews fasted in Medina and the Prophet Sallallahu also fasted. And this ayat, Ya Yuladina Amanu Kutiba Alaikum Asiyam, when this was given, this is what they started with their fast in the Ashura and three days in every month, just like the Jews. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِّيدًا أَوْ عَلَىٰ صَفْرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ Allah says, whoever is a marid, 
whoever is sick. Whoever is on a journey, فَإِدَّتُمْ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ You can make it up in other days. So sickness is a valid excuse to not fast. As well as traveling is a valid excuse for not fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you are sick or you are fasting, then make up the fast in other days. But these people at the beginning when the, the companions reached in Medina, they were given a choice of fasting or paying the fidya. Even if they were healthy and they felt like not fasting, they were given the allowance to pay fidya and don't worry fast. This was, this was the allowance given at the beginning when they now entered into Medina and this ayat came down. If you look at the remaining of the ayat, Allah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah says, for mankind, Allah says, those who have the ability, those who have the strength and the power, they can still give the fidya, paying the fidya by feeding the poor. So it tells us that even though they were healthy, they were given the allowance. Uh, if I want to fast, if you want to fast, fast. If you don't want to fast, just pay the fidya and it is resolved. That is all. This was then. So it was easy, very, very easy for those who had now come to Medina, the fasting at that time. Allah says, فَمَنْ تَتَوَّ خَيْرًا فَوَخَيْرُ اللَّهِ But whoever does optional, whoever exceed in the amount that he's supposed to give. For example, the fidya is such amount. If you give more, Allah says, Khairullah, it is better for you. But Allah then says, Wa anta sumu khairullakum. Allah says, but if you fast, it is better for you in kuntum ta'alamun, if you only knew. So this was the beginning. The next ayat now, now Allah tells us about Ramadan. So there was no Ramadan as yet. Fasting, compulsory. Still, they were given excuses as well as they were given a choice. Now, when Ramadan came into play, which is ayat number 185 of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah, Allah said, the month of Ramadan is the month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the Quran. The month Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent down the Qur'an. The word Ramadan comes from the Ramadan, which means Shiddatul Har, which means severe heat. The Arabs, they were accustomed to heat, but the month of Ramadan was the hottest month. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the hottest month to give them to fast. So Allah is making, by Allah choosing Ramadan now as the month of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it difficult than the fasting of the Jews. Allah is making it difficult than it was when they now came into Medina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the only place in the Quran Allah tells us when the Quran, which month the Quran was revealed. Allah tells us which night we get that from Surah Al-Qadr. Certainly we send it down in Laylatul Qadr. Also, Allah says, Laylatul Mubarakah in Surah, Surah Al-Dukhan. Allah says, so to be said it down in Laylatul Mubarakah. So the night, Allah tells us more than one place, the night he has sent down the Quran. But this is the only place in the Quran, Allah tells us which months Allah sent the Quran. And this is the best of all months. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the best of all books, which is the Quran. On the best of all nights, with the best of all angels, to the best of all Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to the best of all Ummah. This is what we were given. So we were given the Quran, the best of all book, in the best month, the month of Ramadan. And this is why we should have that connection with the month of Ramadan. The, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, use the word kitab. Allah did not say we send down the kitab, we send down the book. Allah says, Shah Ramadan alladhi unzila fihil Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the month Allah sent down the Qur'an, not the kitab, the Qur'an. Allah uses the word Qur'an. Qur'an means that which is recited over and over. 
And this is why this is the month. The month that is coming up is a month that we attach ourselves to the Quran. And Alhamdulillah for many of us who are at home, many times before, many years before you would have said, I had to go to work, I had to do this, I have to do that. So I hardly get in any time to read as much Quran as I wanted. Allah has given you all the time you needed now. Allah has given you so much of time now that you can sit home and if you have never read the Quran from cover to cover, you get the opportunity this year. That is positive from what we are facing. You have the opportunity now to go ahead and try to read out the entire Quran. So the entire Quran was sent down in the month of Ramadan, as we know, in totality from Lawhil Mahfuz, from the sacred tablet, until Sama'i Dunya. And then from Sama'i Dunya, which is the lowest heaven, uh, the Jibreel alayhi salam took 23 years, a period of 23 years to send the Quran, reveal the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. But it was in the month of Ramadan that the entire Quran came down from where it was in Lawhil Mahfuz. So the Quran, then Allah says, Hudalinnas, the Quran is a guidance for mankind. He sent the Quran in the month of Ramadan as a hudalinnas, as a guidance, not a hadi, not a guide, not a manual, but hudan as a form of guidance for mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent in the Quran. Normally when we are in some sort of trouble, we are facing some problem in life, most of us will, if we have a best friend, we'll call out our best friend and ask them for some assistance. At least just talk to them. That is whenever we're facing some harsh, hard times or some difficulty. Allah is telling you the Quran is hudan. The Quran is guidance. When you find yourself those problems, when you find yourself in those hard times, your friend should be the Quran. Allah wants you to not call a friend. Allah wants you to call the Quran. Allah wants you to pick up the Quran, read the Quran, get attached to the Quran. And Allah is going to remove your problems for you. This is why Allah sent the Quran as a huda linnas. Wa bayinati min al huda. Allah says, and clear signs from the guidance. Huda wa bayinati min al huda. Clear signs from the guidance. Now, Allah tells you that it is hudan. It is a guidance for mankind. But what proof do we have that it is guidance for mankind? Allah tells you if you want the proof that the Quran is guidance and the Quran is hudan, then go to the Quran itself. In the Quran, Allah says, in the Quran itself has the clear signs, the clear proof to prove to you that this is really the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why when you see many unbelievers, you give them a, a English Quran and they read through that Quran, they are ready to embrace Islam, many, many of them. Because the Quran itself has all the proofs. Allah says, Wa min al Then Allah says, Allah says, Wal Furqan. Allah says, Wal Furqan. And the Quran is the Furqan, the criteria. Every day of our lives, we have decisions to make, we have choices to make. Allah says the Quran is what gives you, what will help you make the right choice, make the right decision, the Quran. So if you want to know what is true, what is right from what is wrong, he says the Quran is the thing that helps you to know what is right from what is wrong. And then Allah says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ Allah says, whoever witnessed the month of Ramadan, then he must fast. So now the compulsion came. If you are alive in the month of Ramadan, if you are a Muslim, you are Balik, you are seen, you are healthy, you are a Mukim, which means you are not a traveler, then you have to fast in the month of Ramadan. So as long as you enter the month of Ramadan with these conditions, then fal yasum, then you must fast. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now tells us that fasting in Ramadan is compulsory. From this piece of the ayat, all before, nothing about Ramadan. Now Allah tells us fal yasum. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
He says, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفْرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامِ الْأُخَرِ So when this fasting now became compulsory, the fasting of Ashura now became optional. The three days in the month became optional. Now the fasting from Allah says, whoever is sick and whoever is traveling, then فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامِ الْأُخَرِ Then they can make it up in other days. After the month of Ramadan, they can make it up. Nothing about fidya. That choice of paying fidya was only given before the compulsion of the fasting in the month of Ramadan. So if you're sick, Allah says, if you're sick, you can't fast. You don't have a choice to go and pay fidya. You have to wait until when you feel better and after Ramadan, you make up that fast. If you are a traveler, you can't just pay for and say, I don't worry, you have to fast. No, if you know this, if you can't fast because you're traveling, after the month of Ramadan, when you're not a traveler again, you fast. We know traveling in those days are very difficult, very tiresome because of the mode of transport that they had in those days. But for us, our mode of transport is very easy. Sometimes it's very easy to travel for, from different places from one destination to another. So, it is advised by the scholar for us in our time, if you are traveling and you know that you could make it a fast, it is better to fast because even if you make it up after Ramadan, you can't get among the blessing that you will get in Ramadan. But if someone is traveling and they say, I want to not fast because Allah says that I could not fast, then it is allowed because the allowance is given there. If you are on a journey, you're allowed not to fast. So for us as this woman now, fasting in Ramadan is compulsory the entire month. As for the fidya, as for the fidya, the fidya is only, will only be allowed to pay for someone who is in such a sickness that they know to themselves that they are never going to recover. They have such a sickness that there is no hope at all of recovering, then they pay the fidya or they are extremely old and they cannot fast. And you know you can't get younger, it's only old that you are going to get. So if you're extremely old and you're very sickly, then you pay the fidya. But for us who are healthy and we get a flu or we get a little virus during the month of Ramadan, we can't say pay the fidya and say, hey, I have paid the fidya, I don't have to make up no fast. No, that is only for that case of those who are very old and those who are very sickly and hope that they're not going to recover from the sickness. Other than that, we have to fast. If we cannot fast, we are sick, we're on a journey, wait and make it up after the month of Ramadan. We don't have an easy way out to pay for it Only when we, inshallah, when we reach extremely old, then that allowance is going to be given to us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, you read Allah become al yusr wala you read it become al usr. Allah says Allah wants to make it easy for you, and Allah does not want to make it hard for you. Again, Allah wants to make it easy for you, and He does not want to make it hard or difficult for you. Now, if you compare the fast of the Jews and the fast of the Muslim with the whole month of Ramadan, it is uh, it is high. It, it is definitely more difficult, more harder than the fast of the, the Jews. Similarly, <coughs> the fast of the people when they had now come to Medina, their fast was easy because they had a choice to pay the fidya or not. So now we will say our fast is a lot more also a lot more difficult than the fast of the past. But Allah is telling us something different. Allah says, you read Allah become a user. The reason Allah gives you the month of Ramadan, because Allah only wants ease. Allah don't want to make any hardship or difficulty for you. Now, in order for Allah promises to come true, but Allah wants to make it easy, Allah made it easy personally. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so our minds are going to think 30 days of fasting, 29 days of fasting, not three days anymore. But what Allah does is Allah makes it so easy. But as you mentioned, the doors of Jannah open, the fire of Jahannam closed, Shaitan, she end up. And you see how fast the, the days go by. 
the days go by so quickly when it comes in, you can you can recall where did this month really go those who are observing outside unbelievers when they see us fasting they say that that is hard that is difficult but if you ask muslims who are accustomed fasting say, that is nothing that is so easy allah tells you allah wants it ease for you and if as long as you make that effort, Allah has put things in place to make sure that it is easy. All that you have to do is make that a sacrifice to pass and Allah is going to make it easy. So Allah says, you read Allah become al yusr, wala you read it become al usr. Then Allah says, well, it took me lul iddata. Allah wants you to complete a full number. You can't just say, I feel the fast a few days and I need to take a few days rest. And then I fast a few days. And sometimes you have people, it is sad, but you hear even others saying, at least I fast 10 days in this month, or I fast 15 days. As adults and as people who fast in this compulsory, well, it took me a little data. Allah says, you must complete the full number. Your aim is to fast the entire month, the full 29, the full 30 days of Ramadan. There are many punishments in the different narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu speaking about those who are able to fast and they just choose not to fast. The amount of sins and burden that they are going to have to face on the Day of Judgment. So we don't want to be amongst those who are going to be punished for that. So as individual is compulsory on us, Allah says, well, he took me to it down. And Allah is doing his part. Allah is ensuring that you get ease in order for you to pass. Allah says, well, you took up bil Allah ala ma hadakum, wala ala kum tashkurun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Allah wants you to glorify, to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what he has guided you to. That is throughout the day, whilst you are fasting, you do a lot of zikr, do a lot of takbir, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah akbar. This is how you spend your time whilst fasting in a month of Ramadan, Allah says, Wala allakum tashkurun. Allah says, perhaps you will be tashkurun. Wala allakum tashkurun. Perhaps you are going to be grateful and thankful to Allah. So that is 185. So we had 183, 184, 185. 186, ayat or verse 186, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about dua. And then 187, Allah goes back into fasting. So out of all the places now, Allah chose to insert an ayat that some of us might think it is not related to actual fasting, but Allah chose this spot now to just push this ayat and snap it in. Allah says, وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ إِبَادِ أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيمٌ Allah says, when my servant asks you about me, they were asking if to make dua loud, to make dua soft. The Allah says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Allah says, I am near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ I am near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, قُلْ فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ did not say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to say to them that I am near. Allah says, I want to answer these people myself. They are asking about me. And they are very important to me, so I am going to answer them myself. It's like, for example, you go by someone's office and you want to speak to the boss and they put you there to sit down. You say, hey, I want to speak to so-and-so. The secretary goes in, the boss sends out a message and say, you know what? So-and-so will speak to you in next five minutes, next 10 minutes. You get response from a medium, which is the secretary. That is one. You don't feel so important. But for example, you go and you ask the secretary, I want to speak to the boss. And the secretary goes in or telecom the boss. And so then the boss hears your name. So and so wants to speak to you. The boss say, wait, wait, I'm coming here right now. Puts down the phone, walks out of the office and say, yes, come, I want to talk to you. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this person who is sitting waiting will feel important. Because the boss didn't leave a message, the boss came out immediately and wanted to speak to him. So Allah is saying, the people are asking Muhammad about me. 
instead of I send a message with Muhammad Sallallahu I want to reply to that myself, but in the Qarib, I am there. And Allah says, Uji da'a da'an. I answer the supplication of the supplicant whenever he supplicates. I answer the supplication of the supplicant whenever he supplicates. Allah did not say, I answer the supplication of the sinning one or the righteous one or the God conscious one. Allah says, any one of you raise your hands, I'm ready to accept. This is how loving is Allah. As long as you raise your hands, I'm ready to accept. So the reason it is mentioned, the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this ayat right in the middle, right inside the paragraph that he has placed for Ramadan and for fasting is to show that whilst we are fasting, the importance of making dua, making a lot of duas. This is something that we should be involved in. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says one of the times that duas are accepted is at the time of, of breaking the fast. When we're going to break our fast, we make dua. And not only then, whilst we are fasting throughout the day, as soon as we get some time, we make dua, the importance of dua. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has placed this purposely to show us the importance of making dua whilst fasting. Because when we are fasting, Allah is so happy with us. And when someone is happy with you and you ask them for anything, they give it to you. If your parents are happy with you and you ask them for something, they're going to give it to you. If your boss is happy with you and you ask him for something, he's going to give it to you. Allah is happy with you when Allah sees you fasting. If you ask Allah for anything, Allah is going to give it to you. So this is why Allah placed it there. Now, the next ayat, which is ayat number 187, which is the last ayat. I have seen that we have crossed over an hour already. And I don't want to go on too long. So I'll just highlight what this ayat was speaking about. We will not go into details with this ayat. This is the last ayat that speaks about fasting. One of the, the beliefs the, the companion have, companions had was that because they are, it's the month of Ramadan came and they are fasting during the day, they would not want to have any relationship with their wives in the night, feeling it is Ramadan and we can't have any close relationship with our wives in the night. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down this ayat. Allah says, Allah says, it is permissible for you. Up to today, we still get questions like that. People come and ask you, um, is it permissible for you to have relationship with your wife in the night of the mother of Ramadan? Yes, Allah is in it in the Quran. Allah says, Allah says, Allah says it is permissible for you to approach your wife, to have close relationship with your wives in the nights of the month of Ramadan. It is allowed. It is permissible. During the day you fast, you don't fast in the night. During the day you stay away from food, you stay away from drink, and you stay away from relationship with your spouse. If in the night you are able to eat, you are able to drink, then in the night you are able to have relationship with your spouse as well. So Allah is telling you, it is allowed in the night. Don't make it difficult on yourself. Don't feel that the whole month I have to be, I have to stay away from my wife. I have to stay away from my husband. I can't be close to them. Allah says, no. Allah says, they, they are a garment for you and you are a garment for them. And then Allah tells you when, from what time to what time, should you stay away from eating and drinking in the ayat when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says wash wakulu washrabu hatta yatabayyana lakum al khayt al abya min al khayt al aswad min al fajr eat and drink as long as the white thread hatta yatabayyana lakum al khayt al abya min al khayt al aswad until the white thread until the white thread is apparent from the black thread, which means after the night and the light starts to come in, up to then, which means as soon as the dawn starts, the early dawn starts and you see some brightness in the sky, stop eating, stop drinking, stop having relationship with one's spouse. And then at the end of the ayat, Allah says, Wala, wala Allah tells you about the itikaf, that 
only in the last 10 days, nights of Ramadan and days of Ramadan, in those nights, the last 10 nights, if you're in Etikaf, then only if you are in Etikaf and the Sunnah Etikaf, only then you cannot have a relationship with your wife. But the other 20 nights of Ramadan, you're allowed to. It's only the, if, and only if you're in Etikaf. If you're not in Etikaf, then you can still have a relationship with one spouse. So these are the ayat I just highlighted, ayat number 187. These are the ayats in the Quran that speaks about Ramadan and about fasting. This is what Allah has to say about Ramadan and fasting. We know that there are many narrations, many hadiths speaking about virtues and blessings and what you could do in order to get more blessings. We should all try to practice those as well in order to get the full maximum benefit of the month of Ramadan. I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our effort, grant us the ability to witness and be in the month of Ramadan with good health so that we could make do or make benefit of the everything that there is in the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of our efforts. May Allah accept all of our good deeds. May Allah grant us a tawfiq to do a lot of good deeds in the month of Ramadan. We know the month of Ramadan we like to do a lot of charity as well. Most of us, we keep back our zakat until Ramadan because of blessings being multiplied. We try our best to do, be it whatever situation we are in, we try to gain as much blessings as we can because this world is temporary. What we have to work on is preparation for the hereafter. And Ramadan is something like little Qadr, all of that that is involved in the month of Ramadan, it is given to us for preparations for the next life. So be it if you're in quarantine, be it if you're in a shutdown, be it if we cannot go out, we can still make use of the time and the days of the month of Ramadan. This inshallah, we end. I don't know if there's any questions. Inshallah, we'll answer it. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.